my subtext or agenda was uh, a lot of people in Melbourne are now rethinking the relevance of this event. It's got a long history, uh, but a number of people are beginning to wonder whether it's worth the effort. Uh, so it's one thing to question it, but it's another thing to rationally and objectively work out whether it is in fact good for Melbourne. So, uh, there's the circuit, looks very good. There's the, the track, ah, Melbourne gets prime place, which is important, uh, as we'll come to look at in a few minutes. So, the question that I was asking myself based around a lot of what the media was saying, the events coming up in a, in, in a few weeks, is the F1 Grand Prix good for Melbourne? <clears throat> well, it appears to be good. This is the interesting thing. When you look at it in a general sense, as a sports fan, you'd say, yep, it promotes the city to a global audience. It brings tourists to the city who spend on accommodation, food, drink, entertainment and the like. And it appears to engender some civic pride and social cohesion. So who could argue with, with those benefits? What's the problem? Why are we complaining? Why are there reservations? And does it serve the interests of key stakeholders? Well, the Victorian state government seems to think it's a great event. Melbourne City Council likewise. Uh, the Formula One organisers love Melbourne. It's the, it's the first event of the year. They think it's a fantastic beginning. The F1 teams seem to enjoy it. The drivers get quite excited about coming to Melbourne. The event managers think it's one of the great events on the calendar. Sponsors are a little wary, but there's enough sponsorship to suggest that they value it. Broadcasters get beside themselves with excitement and enough fans go to make it viable, probably. So, what's the concern? If all the stakeholders are happy and those other general benefits are occurring, what's the problem? Well, I think there is a problem. That's the problem. And just have a look at that, two numbers. Now, again, I preface all the numbers I'm putting for you today, they are slightly rubbery because I've taken them from a number of sources but if you like they're in the ballpark. So you can quiz me about the exact number but generally speaking what I'm giving you is roughly what every study has said. There it is. In 2014 it generated 38 million dollars of revenue. It cost 98 million dollars to mount and run. So who would in their right mind run an event year after year, 20 years, that runs at that sort of operating loss? What's, what's going on here? How many event organisers can sustain operating losses every year of that amount? That's the largest, but they've always been operating losses for 21 years. This event never runs at a profit. So the question is why have it? What's going on here? How can we explain this anomaly? So just to give you a bit of ratio analysis, I teach a bit of sport finance, so I thought I'd throw this one in. What that's saying is that for every dollar that you've spent on the race, you get 40 cents back. That's what it's telling you. It's just not viable financially. Uh, but then you might say, but hang on, there's another way of looking at events like these. These are, if you like, the externalities or the social benefits and costs. So, it's all very well to be running at a loss, but there are other benefits that you need to take into account. There's an economic impact, an image and exposure impact, and a community pride impact, which I've just briefly um, looked at. Now the the problem here, of course, is to say, yeah, there's, a, there's an economic impact, a pride impact, a, a social impact, an image impact, but how can you quantify or monetize those impacts? Because the operating profit is monetized, isn't it? They're dollars. 
so the question is, if you're serious, you need to be able to monetize or put a value, a dollar value, on these impacts. And it does happen, and um, economists are good at doing this. The economic impact uh, is measured by the number of visitors that you get and the amount of money they spend. Uh, and in 2014, they spent around $34 million. Uh, but you might say, is that the economic impact or benefit? No, the economists would say, no, that's just the total amount of spending. To get the impact, you've got to work out how much suppliers spent to generate the services to provide that sort of expenditure. So if you look at a markup of 20%, then basically the economic benefit in net terms is only about 7 million, not 35 million. So what you find is that the proponents of the event say, ah, oh, there was an economic benefit of 34 million. That was just how much was spent. But when you look at the net surplus generated by suppliers, it's usually about 20% of that, so it's only 7 million. So that's a way of just deflating the economic benefit. What about international exposure impact? Now, it looks good on paper. Uh, 4 million view in the UK, 3 million in France, 5 million in Germany, um, 300 million apparently overall. Uh, and an estimate was made that the advertising equivalent value to Victoria, particularly the Melbourne Victoria signature, provided 40 million in benefit. Now that's okay, isn't it? But so what? So what have you got 40 million dollars of free advertising? That's not the benefit. The benefit is what happens subsequent to the advertising. And uh, very little work has been done to measure the tourist impact following on from the global awareness and advertising. So there's really not much you can say about that. The social impact. And this is where the proponents of the Grand Prix say, engenders enormous civic pride. If you're living in Melbourne, you feel really good about this event. So much so that you're prepared to claim that running at a profit isn't important. And one way of measuring social impact around the civic pride is to ask people, how much are you prepared to pay to keep the event in Melbourne? Now, no one's done this yet, but if you said, oh, look, I'd be prepared to pay 70 to keep it in Melbourne. There are 500,000 of you who did that. You'd be valuating your civic pride at 35 million. That seems excessive, doesn't it? Would 500,000 Melbournians claim that they want to keep the Grand Prix? I'm not sure they would, given that only 70,000 people paid to buy a ticket to enter the Grand Prix. So again, that seems a highly inflatable value to put on the civic pride. On the other side of the agenda, though, there are social costs. Now, these are very difficult to quantify, but they can be quantified. Uh, the loss of park amenity. People can no longer go to Albert Park for three to four weeks. They're basically barred from entering the park. There's a cost there. There's an impost on police and emergency services. There's pressures on transport, both private and public. There's noise and related inconvenience. I live about eight k's from the uh, Melbourne Park, but you can hear with a sort of a south westerly wind, you can hear the, the, the cars for seven hours on a Saturday. Um, but even if you monetize those, uh, you're probably looking at no more than 10 million, probably only $5 million in cost. So the, the social costs are not that high, even though people complain about the cost and the noise. If you value them um, using disruption and what people are prepared to pay to have a safe and, and quiet environment, you're only looking at five to 10 million. So, whatever way you look at it, the Grand Prix is a drain on our resources. If you look at the revenues, 38 million in ticket and other sales sponsorship, Visitor impact, 7 to 34. 34, I said, really is ridiculously high. It's more 7. Uh, international exposure, hard to measure. Civic pride, 35 million would be very, very high. It's more 5 to 10. So basically, your best case estimate might be 107 million, but that is really just something that I dreamt up. You could never claim that objectively. 
it could be nearer 60 or 70. Worst case estimate, 50 million. So the argument is, in terms of total valued benefits, you're probably looking at between 50 and 60 million dollars of benefit for the event. There's no way that that 170, in my view, is realistic. But I put it up just to show that that's the absolute ceiling. But what about the costs? Best case estimate, 103. That's what had been measured. Worst case, uh, 108. So if you took the worst case estimate against the worst case estimate for expenses, you're looking at this massive gap. How can you defend that sort of number? How can you argue that the Formula One Grand Prix is good for Melbourne? If you're trying to monetize all those benefits and costs and you come up with a 107 best case estimate for revenue and a 103 best case estimate for expenses. You still, what, that $60 million difference? That's a massive shortfall of benefit over cost. So why do we have it? Why does Melbourne retain the Grand Prix? Why does Daniel Andrews, our current Premier, say it's a great event for Melbourne when they're the figures you've got to work with? So I'm slightly perplexed. What's going on? Is something else happening? So you may have some advice at question time. At the moment, I can only come up with two reasons for defending the indefensible. One is what they call public choice theory. And it's just a cynical view of government and politicians, basically, by saying, uh, they just want to build monuments to, the, to themselves and their, their political reign. They just want to leave a legacy. They don't want, want to be remembered for doing something valuable for the city. And there's something in that because if you go back to the 1980s, and it's really interesting that when I refer back to the 1980s in Melbourne, we were called the rust bucket capital of Australia because our Industries were just falling backwards. And guess where people migrated to from Melbourne in the 1980s? The Gold Coast. <laughs> and they're still here, I think, a lot of them. Um, but there was a guy called John Kane, a Premier of the day, and he believed that we had to do something to revitalise Melbourne. And what he did was reinvent the Australian Open Tennis Championships and invested, I think, half a billion dollars initially in creating the National Tennis Centre um, in Jollymont. And that was the start of Melbourne's sporting development. So you could argue, yeah, public choice theory, politicians serving not just the interests of the community, but sometimes their own interests by building a legacy or a monument to their own political career. And the other one, I think, so it is a very important one, is city rebuilding theory or rebranding theory, is that from the 1880s, Melbourne had to rebrand and reinvent itself. Melbourne was going backwards fast as a major metropolis. And through the 80s, through Kane, and through the 1990s, through our next Premier, John, uh, Jeff Kennett, there was a strategy of making or creating Melbourne as a sport city. And if you look at the last 30 years, or 25 years, that's what seems to have, uh, have happened. And that's a, a way of explaining why we retain events like the Formula One Grand Prix. They run at a loss, but they're a small plank in a much larger platform that looks at sport as an engine of growth and sport as a strategy for structural change. So even though the Grand Prix is not viable but by any measure, it's still seen as important because it's part of this broader agenda about making Melbourne a major world sport centre. So that's my explanation. Uh, but if you just want to look at the event from the cold, hard facts of monetization, it, it is, in short, an absolute dud. Thank you.